how to use it. Ah, I guess I'll figure it out. All right, so, so, um, all right. So, I don't know how to use this yet, so I'll figure it out. Okay, good. So yes, I'm Nathan. Um, I'm a senior here, uh, for those who don't know, studying robotics, and I'm gonna give my speech on honesty. Let's see if this works. Okay, so about me. This is a slide I wish all the seniors do, because it's my favorite, one of my favorites. So, some of the things I like to do, I like, uh, I like robots, I like um, working on artificial intelligence, I like building, mostly code, stuff like that. It's fun. I like uh, worship, as you guys see sometimes. I like to praise God, I like to just play guitar, it's a lot of fun. I like Kung Fu. I actually do that, uh, I used to do that a lot. I like uh, weightlifting and just seeing um, I don't know, some of the masters, how they can train their bodies, it's pretty cool. So I've always been interested in that. I like Smash, as some of you may know. I like playing that a lot. Uh, so that's what I usually do. Um, yeah, I also played sports. I uh, did tennis for a couple of years, four years, I think. And fishing for about ten years. Uh, so I did that growing up. But I think the thing that defines me the most is probably uh, thinking. One of my favorite things to do is to just study philosophy, psychology, or theology, and I like to learn more about that kind of stuff. So yeah. So this is my family. So going from the far left, my uncle, cousin, cousin, my grandma, my grandpa, baby cousin, me, my mom, another cousin, my aunts, and my brother. Now these pictures are a bit old. The top left corner we have me, we have my stepdad, we have my mom again, and my brother. And on the right side, we have my uh, dad's side of the family. We have uh, me, uncle and aunts, my dad and my stepmom, brother, cousins, my grandma and grandpa, and another baby cousin. So yeah. So yeah. Um, so I can tell you guys a little bit about my family's history. Thought that'd be interesting. On my mom's side, uh, everyone comes from India, um, and they were actually relatively poor. So, like I, I heard recently that. My grandpa's sister actually died because they didn't have enough money for food. So that's how poor they were. Um, they lived right, so in India there's a caste system, which means there are like different levels of like how important you are in society. And my family was right below the untouchables, which were like the worst, because they had defects and stuff like that. Right? So that's, that was where my family came from. But my grandpa, the one in the bottom left, he was the only one capable of going to school, like, capable of understanding it out of 13 brothers and sisters. So he, that like they pooled their money together to send him to college, against his will actually, to become a doctor. And he was able to provide for everyone so that, you know, I could come here, my parents can have a better life. And that's how they moved to America. On my dad's side, it's equally strange. Um, so uh, when my dad was 17, there's a civil war, but his side is from Sri Lanka, which is another place. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a war going on. He even said he saw bombs falling from the sky and other weird things like that. So, obviously not good to stay there. So, my parents, uh, my grandparents set, sent him on a one way to America, which back then was really expensive. So the rest of them actually went to Australia. He he didn't even know English, or he didn't have any money. Actually, he had seventeen dollars, I think. But he was able to learn English and uh, get three jobs, and able to provide for my family. Uh, back in Australia, and eventually married my mom. That's how I came about. So yeah, um, that's about it. So how how faith became real to me. So kind of like my my walk. Um, so it, it so it kind of started with uh, um, I was five or seven, and I was remember hearing about they're preaching about hell at at Kitty Church, and I was like really scared. Obviously, it was like hell, like oh crap, I'm like. I don't want to go there. So I decided to give my life to God because I thought, you know, I knew it was real. And I just thought that was the best thing to do. Um, but, you know, obviously going, coming to God through fear isn't always the best motive. It, it, it lasts, but it, it's not something you can continue with the rest of your life. So it had to become real for me somehow. Um, but how it became real is when I was around 13, everything started to, to compile. One of the first things was I, was I was bullied a decent amount in school because I was a lot different than everyone else. Um, 
mostly it was just because of my personality, actually, because I was really, really awkward back then. I, not like, I think I'm awkward now, but I was like, it was a lot worse. I was, I, I don't know, I said the weirdest things for no reason. Um, if I don't already, but um, not only that, I was also physically different because I was like, you know, Indian and skinny. Everyone was white or beast ish. So it was, I was, it was kind of on the, um, I just looked a lot different. Um, then on top of that, I didn't really have any friends. Uh, it's mainly because I didn't really want any per se. It wasn't something that really crossed my mind. I just kept to my video games, I guess. In addition to that, my parents were getting a divorce when I was seven, I think. So there was a lot of fighting, a lot of yelling, and a lot of weirdness there, so that wasn't normal. Um, I fought with my brother like literally every day. And I actually thought fist fighting was normal for, for brothers, but like, so we literally like punched each other as hard as we can. I thought that was normal, but apparently it's not. So, um, so we did that a lot. And there was even this girl I liked when I was 13. Um, I could never talk to her, and I said something that didn't, didn't work out, obviously. So I was like, eh, well, that was hard too. But so that, that was my life growing up. That was kind of my middle school, high school. So not, not the most pleasant, you could say. But luckily, it kind of got my, my, mo my uh, mindset on straight. Like, who? No, no one has been there for me, not even one person, not my parents, not my friends, not anyone. So there has to be someone. I think there has to be someone. There can't just be no one. I can't just rely on myself. I've tried that. It didn't work. And that's when there was this song, Everything by Lifehouse, that they played in chapel. And the words are, because you're all I want and you're all I need. You're everything, everything. And how can I stand here with you and not be moved by you? Would you tell me how could it be any better than this? And I was listening to these words. I'm just like, I, I don't know. I, I think it was, I felt, I don't know. I felt something. I understood something. It was like, God has always been there for me. He is everything I've ever wanted or needed. And I keep trying to look at it. These, I keep trying to find it in these other things like, like, like friends and my family and relationships. And all of that fails. The only thing that was always there for me was God. God is the only person who has always been there for me. So, since then, I started to read the Bible a lot, and I started to write a lot too, and uphill from there. Or, yeah. Well. So, let's get into the main topic. So, I wanted to talk on honesty today. So, I wanted to talk about honesty because honesty is probably something that. Um, defines me more than most things, I think. Like, I remember when I was a kid, some kid asked me, like, you know, if I was to do something really bad, would you tell on me? And I'm like, um, yeah, if it was bad enough. And I didn't realize that was an awkward thing to say. I said, that a lot. I said things like that a lot. Because I was just being honest. I'm like, that's, I think that's something I would do. Um, so when, a lot of us, when we think of honesty, we think of, what, the Ten Commandments? We think of, like, thou shalt not lie. Or... Thou shalt not bear false witness, maybe. But um, in addition, that's very good. But I also want to um, relate it to something else. Because when I think of honesty, I think of a, uh, how a child is always honest with the words he says. You know, he's kind of rude, kind of strange, a little young. But he's always honest with everything he says. And he's also honest with the way he feels. He doesn't really think about how he should act he just acts it. Um, and I think our job as Christians is to find the good or understand the good and be like that. Jesus even says to come to him like children. One verse that I've always liked is Acts 24, 16, which is, so I always take pains to have a clear conscience towards both God and man. So the clear conscience, like what's that? It's like everything in our minds, everything that we think about is that something that I think that God would appreciate? Something that my fellow friends would find to bring them up as opposed to tearing them down? Am I being honest with myself? I hope so. Okay, so the first one is being honest with God about His plan for our lives. So, let's read this. Job 7.20 If I sin, what do I do to you, you watcher of mankind? Why have you made me your mark? Why have I become a burden to you? So this is the story of Job. 
It was a man who had basically everything you could ask for. He had like a, he had uh, money, fame, friends, wife, kids, any expenses. And God allowed Satan to take everything from him. And he didn't have any reasons or anything. He just that just happened. And we see here that Job was really honest with God. We find later that it wasn't good that Job was like not having faith in God. But what is good about this is that he was completely honest with God. Because I think like if you, like just think about it, if you had everything taken from you in your life, I think the natural reaction is to, is to ask God why. And I think that is something that God like likes. He wants us to talk with him. He wants us to be like in a relationship in that sense. Um, it says like, why have you made me your mark? Like, what have I done to you, God, to deserve this? Um, but Job here was really honest with God about his plan for his life. You know, he wasn't just going to give up after everything was taken from him and his body was basically dead. He kept fighting. So, one example in my own life is that uh, when I was a freshman, um, I really wanted to be like an evangelist, which is a term to mean just helping people know more about God, but like kind of like in mass amounts or something like that. And I, re I really just wanted to like share the good news because it changed my life when I was like 13-ish. So I wanted to give that to other people. But what God was telling me over and over was like, that is not the calling I have for your life. Like that's a good thing and you're going to help people know God, but I have a different calling for you. So I'm like, and I just fought it for like two years. I wasn't really being honest what I thought God was telling me. And when I started listening, he told me, um, your calling is to be one with knowledge. You're supposed to know the Bible and you're supposed to be able to explain it when necessary. So what I said is, that's dumb. Like, knowing the Bible, anyone, anyone can read the Bible. It's easy to know things. What's so cool about that? And then I realized, well, I just said cool. I think I'm focusing on the wrong things here. I'm like, all right, I'll do this if you want. And then I learned throughout the future that God has blessed me in so many more ways because of that. Um, so yeah, being honest with God about his plan. Have you asked God? about your purpose though because you know on college most of us anyways trying to figure out God's plans for our life have you asked him like have you just been honest with him like no why is this happening or what is my plan okay another way to be honest with God is about what we want so Esther 736 then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, Who is he and where is he who has dared to do this? And Esther said, A foe and enemy, this wicked Haman. So this is a story about a queen who, um, you know, God put her to be um, queen after the last queen, and the thing is, her, the the man Haman, who was right next, who was the right hand man to the king, was trying to kill all of the Jews, which are, and and Queen Esther was a Jew. So Esther came to a place in her life where she was really honest with God about what she wanted. She prayed and was like, you know, God, like why did why did you put me here? You know. This, this, like this king got rid of the last queen because she wouldn't be summoned when he wanted. And, and just, why are you putting me here? And then, and then this, this crazy guy was trying to kill all my people, including me. So, and God, and God was telling her through his, the uncle to go to the king and tell her what Haman is doing. And she, she, I mean, I can only imagine that she probably was afraid. She was like, he could kill me, and who am I to approach the king? He, he even said to not have anyone approach him. But she was honest. She knew what she wanted. She wanted her people to be saved. And for that, she said, a foe and enemy, this wicked Haman. And eventually, he was um, executed for that. 
So in that honesty, much, much good happens. So example in my life is, um, if I was honest with God, one of the things that I really wanted is I wanted to see people get saved. I wanted to see a revival. A revival is when many people become saved, as I was just mentioning a few minutes ago. And that's something I've always really wanted. And that's mainly just because I've just seen what God has done in my life, and I see people aren't living like that. And I'm just like, I don't know, I don't see how that's even possible to live without God, because because I, I think I know where I would be if I didn't have God, and it wouldn't be in a really good place. And I was mad because for the first, my freshman and sophomore year, I'm like, no one's getting saved. No, no one is coming to Christ. If, if you are a real God, then why is no one, why is no one being saved? Like, I don't understand. But I continue to be honest with God with what, what, with what I wanted, and I didn't give up. We actually pray for revival every day. We've been doing this for about three years now. We, we still do it, so if anyone's interested, you can come talk to me or someone else. But then eventually, I met a guy by the name of Oscar. And Oscar, when I first met him, he wasn't saved. Um, but over the course of a few months, he became saved. It was, it was one of the first cases of being friends with someone who became saved. And I saw what his life was like before, and after and now, because you know, he's my roommate and we talk a decent amount. And it's, it's a world of difference. The, the amount of, the things he was focused on, the things, the, the way he was, well, I won't go into it, but like that, that's just, and what he is now, he's, al he's always happy, he's always striving for something more, always wanting to help people. It's a world of difference. Like this is what I'm, this is what I'm like wanting, a revival. He, some, God revived his heart to be one filled with much more greater things. But to me that still wasn't like, okay, that's cool, but there's billions of people who are suffering too, so what, what about that? And another thing that happened is that um, you used to go to church fellowship, as some of you know, and it merged with uh, Next Level Church, NLC. And at NLC, approximately nine people a week get um, to know the love of God in their own lives. And to me, that was one of the like, most amazing things I've ever seen. I'm just like, I've never even heard of that. Like my church bring like a year, five people come in and maybe a couple get saved, but nine people get saved a week? That's nine people who are lived, their lives are changed. About 500 a year. One thing Pastor Josh uh, always says is, you know, it's not about the numbers. It's not about you know, how many people our church is getting. But what it is about is people knowing Jesus. It's people knowing the person who wants to love us, wants to be there for us. And so I'm kind of glad that I'm a part of something that's bigger in that sense. So what is it that you want? So I feel like a lot of us ask God that. If we're honest with God, what is it that we really want? What is it that, whether it's good or bad, what is it that we want? Is that something we're asking God? Okay. So in addition to being honest with God, um, it's being honest with yourself, with accepting who you are. So Luke 7, 37 and 38. And behold, a woman of the city who was a, sin a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet and with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. So this is a story about a prostitute who was, um, you know, obviously probably living a bad life not having much money, and she heard that Jesus was coming into her town. She realized that and this might be one of the only chances I get to have my sins forgiven, or so she thought. So she bought an alabaster, alabaster flask of ointment, which in those days, for like a, a prostitute's wage, it's about uh, one year's salary. So she probably spent all of her life savings on this, just so that she can pour it on a man's feet who she's never met and hope that her sins are forgiven. 
What that says to me is she was ready. She was honest with herself. She was accepting who she was, whether good or bad. Right? She, and, and another thing, she went to the Pharisees' house. Pharisees were the, like the religious people, the people who were always condemning others and telling them, you know, you have to be better. You have to be a better Christian. And that, whatever term they use those days. It's obviously not the place for a prostitute. And she went anyways. And she just laid who she was at Jesus' feet because she was ready to move on. She was ready to live a better life. She was uh, simply accepting who she was. So one thing about me is that uh, um, for a while I've always really disliked the fact that I was skinny. So like that was just something I never really liked because you know, I don't know, I guess guys are supposed to be big. So I used to like um, work out a lot and try to get bigger try to eat more. It didn't really work, obviously. I'm just trying to figure, oh, it's not working. But I eventually realized, like, you know, there's nothing wrong being skinny. There's nothing wrong being like this. God made me this way for a reason. I don't really know what that reason is, but I know that I, I can accept it because <coughs> it's who I am. And besides, I think it's kind of cool being able to squeeze through those tiny little spots, you know, that, <laughs> It's like you see this guy trying to do it, it's like, no, nope, I'll do it, it's yes. fine. Yeah. But, you know, accepting who you are is definitely difficult, but if you're honest with yourself, it's something you'll do. So are you honest with yourself, with who you are? You know, is there something maybe you've done, there's something that you're not proud of? Maybe it's the way you've treated someone else or something, but maybe you're hiding it. Are you honest with who you are? Because I can guarantee you that if you do, it will, it will change your life. Because that's what God's looking for. He's looking for honesty. So be, be honest with yourself when others confront you. So Proverbs 27, 5 to 6. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. So there are times in our lives when uh, someone might confront us about a sin, something going on in our lives. And I think it's pretty natural to just be defensive or ignore it, be like, no, of course not, that's not true, that's not true. Like, I, I don't, I'm not like that, that's not how it is. And I tend to be like that as well. But it says here, you know, faithful are the wounds of a friend. And to me, that's the key word is wounds. Like. If a friend and they want to help you, they will wound you. They will hurt you on purpose. Like they're not trying to harm you, but they're trying to get to a sin in your life. And in that sense, they're hurting you. But they're wounding you because they're trying to help you. And what, I, what I've noticed with things is like if you, if you, if someone like spends enough time to think about what they're saying and going to confront you about a sin, it's likely that it's more, it's more probable to be correct versus just, oh, it's just something that happened. Because confronting people isn't easy, as we all know, right? It's not something that we enjoy doing. Um, and it says, profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Because um, a lot of us like to hear what makes us feel better, right? We like to hear nice things. We like to hear what makes us feel better about ourselves. Um, kisses of an enemy could be thought of as like just having someone tell you what you want to hear, but it's really deceitful in that sense. Um, but rebuking someone is much better than sometimes um, <coughs> like j yeah, rebuking someone is better than just knowing that you love someone. If you love someone, you will rebuke them about something in their, a, a sin in their life. And, it's an issue, it, and it is hard. I know with me, um, I knew a guy named Walter, or he's my mentor to an extent, and he's helped me a lot. He, um, after two years, he came up to me one day and he's like, you know, Nathan, you have this issue that you always talk over people. I'm like, no, I'm not. No, I don't. I don't. It's like I was doing it right then. 
It's like, no, you have an issue. You talk over people. When someone talks, you, you talk over them. And, you know, you do that because you think what you're saying is right. And I'm like, no, I'm doing it because what they're saying is wrong. It, just, it didn't go right. It didn't go well. But the point is, I had to learn that whether or not I'm right or not isn't really the important part. What's important is that it's kinder to humble myself and wait for the person to, to finish what they're saying, even if it is like you know for a fact it's not correct. Because you, you show the person that you care about them and that you're listening to them. Um, that took me a while to fix too, and I'm, not, I'm definitely not finished with it. Are you humble when others confront your sin though? You know, has someone confronted you about something? And you don't have to listen to them. But if they're your friend, it's likely that they've thought about it. And they're trying to do what's best. So are you honest with yourself when others confront you? Okay, so I saved the best for last, or the hardest. And that is being honest with others, with their sins. Well, this isn't the end, but that's my point. Um, 2 Samuel 12, 7 and 9. This guy was named after too. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? This is a story about a prophet named Nathan, a prophet, someone who like hears the word of God. And there was a king named David. He was the... Like, you could think of him as the most righteous person in the world in that sense. He was the king. He was the one God appointed. In fact, it even says in the Psalms that he was the, a man after God's own heart. It's like, I don't, it doesn't say that about anyone else as far as I know. In my opinion. And David was, David was the same David who, who slayed Goliath, the giant. And he was just a tiny guy with a sling and a stone. So that's the same David, the guy who had crazy amounts of courage. But you know what he did? He saw this woman uh, bathing on top of a roof. Why was she doing that? That's, that's kind of stupid if you ask me. But David saw her and he had lust, so he took her and did stuff overnight. So that definitely wasn't good. And to make it worse, he then killed um, her husband because he was afraid of the consequences. So he not only was an adulterer, he was a murderer. And he was also got a man after God's own heart. So I can only imagine what Nathan was thinking. Like, wait, you want me to say what? You want me, you want me to go to the man who slayed Goliath, who just had, who did something with a, a girl, and then, you know, killed the husband. You want me to do all that and tell him he's wrong? Like, who, and I can only imagine he was thinking, like, who am I to do that? I don't have that authority. And even if I did, he's probably going to kill me. You know, he's killed a lot of people in his days. He's at, yeah, I think that's actually why Saul disliked him in the first place, because he, he, he's very good at killing people. And it's like, I don't want to die yet, you know? But this is what it means to be honest with others and their sins. It's when God tells you something, you do your best to be honest with yourself and then confront the person with their sins. Um, so, I, we find later that Nathan was actually uh, good friends with David uh, in, the, in the following chapters and verses because um, they kind of lived life together. And that shows us that Nathan did this out of love. He didn't do this like he wanted to go and attack the person and leave and never see him again. He did this because he cared about David. Now he didn't want to just, because a lot of us think that when someone's confronting us, they hate us or something. I mean, I've thought that. But it's not how it should be anyways. There's a verse, Ephesians 4, 4, 15 and 16 that says, Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. That's saying that when we um, speak the truth, we have to do it in a loving way. We do it for the purpose of becoming more Christ-like. Christ, who is the only perfect person to ever exist. And we're trying to become like Him. We, we, just, we can't just speak the truth 
in a harsh way. We can't just love people without actually telling them, like, if they're sinning, like, that's hurting them, you know? It's a very delicate balance between honesty and gentleness. One of my favorite quotes is by Brandon Manning. It says, in every encounter, we either give life or we drain it. There is no neutral exchange. From a song, Speak Life by Toby Mac. <clears throat> and that kind of re reevaluated the way I view viewed conversations because every conversation that we have can give life to a person, can make them better, can uplift them, or it can hurt, it can destroy, and it can even kill. There isn't really a neutral exchange. And I've thought about this for a while. Like, every conversation, every conversation that you had beginning of FNF that you thought was like funny, every conversation you're going to have afterwards, everything, every little word you say, it brings up or it hurts. So really think about that, um, the words you use and the way you say things, and because we want to give life to each other, not take it away. That's everything, even when you're mad. You know, you want to say, you want to give life. Even when you're confronting someone with their sin, you want to give life. It's very hard to do. Uh, well, another thing I like to point is that if you know something is wrong, right? so if you know something is wrong, don't question if you should tell the person. Instead, question, yeah, instead ask the question, when should I tell them? It's like if you know something is wrong, you might ask yourself, should I tell the person? The answer is probably yes. But when? When is the right time? Is it immediately? Is, should, should I wait? Are they ready to hear it? Those are better questions to ask. So, do you confront others with their sins? You know, you know, have you ever, even recently in the last month or two, have you, have you like, saw sin? Because we all see sin, right? It's not, it's, at least I really hope so. I think we all see sin. Do we confront others with them? Do we do it, um, and do we do it in a loving way? Okay, and being honest with others about your feelings. Matthew 26, 38, and 39. Then he, Jesus, said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So this is um, where Jesus was in the garden right before he was going to be crucified on the cross. And he was telling the disciples to wait a little bit because he's extremely sad. And he told the Father um, that he didn't want to go through it. He didn't want to have the pain of being separated from him, the physical pain, the pain of people betraying him like Peter and Judas. He didn't want any of it. And if you think about it, this is Jesus, like the only perfect person to ever exist. And as I mentioned, earlier in the very beginning, like, we have to be honest with ourselves, with our purpose. Jesus' purpose was to die on the cross. That was the reason why he was put on earth, is to die for our sins, stuff that he didn't even do. And him, even he was honest with the Father about his feelings. He was feeling like he didn't want to die. I know I wouldn't. It's only, it's only natural to not want to die. So God was, uh, well, Jesus was honest with the Father even about his purpose for his own life. Um, so I can give you an example of my own life. It's kind of awkward, but... So there is this friend that I do Bible studies with. He's, I've known him for quite a while. And he and I, we you know, read, um, read the Bible and we do it con pretty consistently. And um, I, actually, I disciple him in the sense that I help um, him to know more about God. And I give him homework to do. Uh, decent amount and for a while he just wasn't doing it like every day it was like week week this wasn't doing it and I was really confused I'm like wait like like why aren't you doing this you know we study the Bible we're supposed to do this 
why aren't you why aren't you doing it? I thought this is what you wanted, this is what I wanted. And then he said something that completely changed me and it a lot more than I can even can probably express in words. And that is he said that he didn't think or he didn't feel that I cared about him. He said that he just didn't he didn't think that was true. It was like and I'm just like, what? <laughs> like, wait a minute, you don't, no, like, what do you mean you don't think that I care about you? Of, co of course I care about you. That's why we're doing this. Why, that's why we've been doing it. It's been friends. That's why we do all these things. Wh what are you even talking about? That doesn't make any sense. And he's like, yeah, I know we do this and stuff, but like, I don't know. I just don't think that you care. I don't feel it. And what I learned through that is that I wasn't being honest with my feelings. I was, because I tend to be un unemotional at times. I, unconsciously, I hide those things because I'm afraid of, various things. He, he, could, he couldn't tell that I cared. What it comes down to is I didn't show that what he did hurt me. I wasn't showing it. Like I was sort of saying it. So then once I realized that, the next thing I said was like, yeah, of course I care about you. It was awkward, but like, of course I care about you. Like, you're my friend. I want what's best for you and it does hurt me that that you're not doing that because I want you to become a better person. That's not something I normally say. And but that's what it means to be honest with with your feelings. So, you know, do your friends and family know how you really feel? Like you really feel. If you feel something, whether it's good or bad, are you honest with them? Do you tell them? Or do you hide it because you're afraid of what they'll think? So why is, why is this honesty thing so hard anyways? Like, why is this something that, like we talk about confronting others and, you know, being honest with ourselves and things like that, but why is this so hard? So sometimes we might think, you know, our problems just aren't as important. You know, like, like, you know, I'm just one person. Why are my problems important? You know, there are people dying and being raped and just a lot of bad things and drugs and, you know, my problem is I want a revival. Like, that doesn't sound like a problem. Like, why would God even listen to me? But God cares about the number of hairs on our head. Like, literally. We have thousands, I don't know how many hairs, I'm not biology, but like, we have a lot of hairs, right? And there's billions of people. And he knows how many hairs on all of our head. It's like, you know, most of us probably probably don't have children yet. But I can only imagine that, you know, if you have a baby and it's just starting to ha grow hair or something, it's like, like, you know, I don't know when they grow hair, honestly. But like, if they had like four or five hairs, it's like, you'd be wanting to know, like, oh, it has like five hairs, you know? And then the next day, it's like, oh, look, it has six. At least, I, I don't know, I would do that. Because I care about my own baby. In the same way, God cares about us. He cares about you. He cares about the number of hairs on your head. That, that much. I thought that was pretty cool. Another thing is that we just maybe don't like ourselves. You know? Like, I don't know, I just don't like myself. I'm, I'm so rude. I'm so quiet. I'm so fat. I'm so skinny. I'm so what? Whatever it is. There's something we don't like about ourselves. I mean, but but we are made in the image of God. God is perfect. He's righteous. He loves perfectly. And we are His image. Like, we're not Him, but we're an image of Him. So, like, we might not like what we have done, but we can and should like ourselves because God likes us. And if God likes us, I think we can like us, right? God, the perfect person who died, you know, I think if He likes us, we can too. The big one is we're afraid of being judged, being hurt, or judging or hurting others. So that, that one that I've heard a lot. We don't like to judge. Judging, that, that even word is something that's heard a lot in, in the culture. It's because it's like we're, we're just afraid of that. It's like, oh, what if they hate me? What if they think this bad of me? What if this, you know, I don't want to, I'm not, I'm not no one's judge. And we're not, only, only the Father is our judge. 
But God, called, but God says better is open rebuke than hidden love. You can't rebuke someone if you haven't judged their action in the first place, as far as I know. But people's opinions don't define you. God's opinion does. I'm sure people have said things to you that is like, you know, you're this, you're that, you know, you're rude. No one will ever like your, just, I don't know, rude things. But God's opinion does. So we have to take that in consideration when we're being honest. Maybe there's someone who is sinning and we want to confront them, but we're afraid. We're like, I I'm not that person's judge. I don't want to hurt them. I don't even have that position. But when, I, when we realize that it is not my opinion that really defines a person, it's God's, then, and God's just using us as a, like a method to help the person learn, then we will understand that faithful are the wounds of a friend. Something that we can do to help our friends. And the last thing is, we're afraid of not being liked anymore. We're afraid, like, if I say something, if I'm honest with someone else, or even myself, really, I might not like myself. This person might not like me. You know, just they're just not going to like me, basically. But real family and friends will always love you. That's what it comes down to. You know, not everyone is going to like you, but you'll have real friends and family, people who care about you, and you know that. Um, that's why we can be honest with them. A lot of us are even sometimes afraid to be honest with our own friends. But, you know, I'd encourage you to be honest as much as you can with your friends and family because if they're real, then they're not going to care if you tell them that thing. You know? They're going to love you anyways. And then you'll find that your friendship grows closer because of that. So in summary, we talked about be, to be honest with God about His plan for your life. Just ask God, what is it that you want me to do in this life? What is my calling? We talked about what, being honest with God about what you want. We all want stuff or things or whatever it is. Be honest with God. Be honest with yourself with accepting who you are. You might have done things in the past you're not proud of. I think we've all been there. But if we're honest with ourselves, we can move on past that and do greater things. When others confront you, if someone says something about you, don't just brush it aside. Really take it in and try to figure out, you know, is this true and why is it true? It, usually more often than not, I think it is true. Be honest with others with their sin. If you have a friend, and if you're just starting this whole confronting business, it's always, obviously better to do, to do it with your close friends because you care about them. And if you see that your close friends is doing something that's sinful or hurting themselves or others, you should confront them with their sins. Be honest with your feelings as well. You know, like I, I, I can probably speak more than anyone that like, yeah, I don't like showing my feelings, but I know that when you're honest with others about their feelings, the air becomes more open and inviting and you're able to just, I don't know, just be honest with what you actually want with stuff. I don't know, it's the best I can get, best I got. Um, I know God says that there's one thing that I can be honest with you about. It's something, it's something that, what is, what is God's, this is God here. He's honest too. What is it that God is trying to be honest with us about? There's one message He can give us. One message He can give you. What is it? It's that I really do love you just the way you are. I mean, that's the crux of the, of the gospel right there. Is because, yeah, we're definitely called to be, to be, uh, to give glory to God and to be holy. But I think if faith, hope, and love abound, and the greatest of these is love, there's something to that. You know, God says, 
you know, despite everything that you've done to hurt other people, despite everything that you've been, despite everything that someone else has done to you, your parents, your friends, anything, you know, people who hate you, your enemies, despite all this sin, despite everything that you've, ba every bad thought you've thought, every bad thing that you do at nighttime when you, when you should be doing something else, like reading the Bible or something, you know, every bad thing, I love you even then. That's, that's like something that my parents can't, like our, our parents can't do, that our friends can't do, our own future spouse can't even do. It's something that only God has done. It even says in Romans 5, 8, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So I can't even imagine like my mom dying for me. That's, that's, that's nuts, right? Like she died. She, she's dying for me to save me. But Christ died while I was still sinning, you know. When I was doing everything bad, when I, because I, I know how I would have been, and it wouldn't have been godly. It wouldn't have been something that God would have been proud of. But He died for me then. That's the gospel. That's what it means to be honest. Oh, it's God being honest with us. Um, so yeah. Let's pray. Uh, <clears throat> Dear God, thank you for everything. I thank you for uh, today and what you've taught us today about honesty. I pray that um, something stuck in all of our minds, whether it's being honest with you, or with ourselves, or with others, that we learn something about um, just what it means to, to be honest. Um, it's definitely a difficult topic, and it we do have to take pains to get there, but I pray that you guide us. You're always with us. You always loved us. Help us to do that. In Jesus' name, amen.